Anyways, this evening I'm going to uh, begin with a, um, a new study in, in 1 Thessalonians. I hope to um, talk about some end time issues in this study of Thessalonians, but um, we probably won't get there for a, a little bit. But uh, the first um, message is uh, about turning, and so I've uh, entitled this message, Turn, Turn, Turn. And um, let's begin with a word of prayer. We'll get into this evening's message. Gracious Father, Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that we can study your word. Let this word be a blessing to each of us, Lord. Give us a divine download. Settle our hearts and minds. Let us turn off our phones and, and focus on your word and how that word can transform our lives, how that word can change our lives, bless our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, it's interesting because a lot of people wonder how even a Christian is defined. And um, it used to be if you weren't Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist, you were probably a Christian. Whether you were Catholic or Lutheran or Episcopal or Baptist or whatever flavor. But now it seems like the word Christian actually means something even more specific than that. Um, if, if we look at um, all the things that are considered... You know, I mean, what makes a difference in terms of what our religion is? Um, and so that's what we're going to look at. One of the things we'll look at today. It's kind of a confusing issue because some people think that just because they go to a church or attend a church or they're a church member, that makes them a Christian. But that's really not true. Um, so we're going to begin a new... Um, a new adventure into the book of Thessalonians. And um, I want to say something right at the beginning this evening, um, that the study of the book of First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians will probably surprise a lot of people. And if you're unfamiliar with your Bible, which most people are for the most part, you might even have trouble finding this book because this book is just a relatively very short book. The best way to find it is go to the Gospel of John and then turn right. You'll go past Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians. You'll hit a series of short letters, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And when you finally pass Colossians, you'll come to First Thessalonians. But you have to be careful at this point because it's a real short book. And if you hit First Timothy, you've gone too far. And I've decided to teach on this little delightful book that I call or consider a delightful book because of the spiritual state of our congregation. There's a lot of people that have no clue what being a Christian really is. And there's a lot of people that are just untaught in the Christian faith. They've heard this and that or they know from grandma or mama or some other person um, all about Christianity, but usually a lot of that information is flawed. And so um, hopefully this little book I think will help us clarify what a true Christian really is. But before we jump into this epistle, it's important to, to know a few facts, several facts about First Thessalonians. The first fact is, it's one of the oldest books in the entire New Testament. Scholars date this book back to 50 to 51 AD, meaning that it was written after about 18 years of the life and ministry and death of Jesus. And as such, it's one of the earliest pictures that we have of the Christian church at its very beginning. In fact, our earliest missionary document is probably contained in this book. It's the only book that might be older than this. Um, First Thessalonians are possibly James. The book of James was written by Jesus' half-brother. And maybe Galatians, but scholars differ on that. So it may or may not be even a widespread difference, maybe one or two years but it's also one of the shortest books in the New Testament. Actually, 
1 Thessalonians contains only 79 verses. You could easily read this book in less than 30 minutes. And then another thing is, it's one of the easiest books to understand. Um, I love the book of Romans, but unlike Romans, there's no complicated theology in this book. No complicated theology to try to ponder. Everything that Paul writes is very simple in this book. It's very clear, it's very direct, very straightforward. It's not a doctrinal um, uh, book per se that raises a lot of hard questions like other books in the New Testament. It's a short letter to a very young church. And another point is it's probably one of the most practical books in the New Testament. I like to think that James is a very practical book in the New Testament, but um, this is also a very practical book in the New Testament. In just five short chapters, the Apostle Paul deals with a, a, a wide range of truth. And hello, that's one of the things that's really missing in a lot of us today. Most of us don't even know what truth is. We think we do, but we don't. I mean, truth is whatever we want to believe is true, and that'll just get you in trouble if that's what your um, understanding of truth is. And some of the topics include what true conversion is, what integrity is, what compassion is, what the Word of God really is all about, our heavenly rewards, what suffering is all about, and prayer, and moral purity. Wow, isn't that one lacking in our society? <laughs> and hard work. Um, in fact, Paul the Apostle in in Thessalonians says if a person doesn't work they shouldn't eat and the second coming of Christ the role of spiritual leaders dealing with difficult people we get those at our food pantry um, we had a lady yesterday <laughs> oh boy oh I could tell you stories I, best, I better not digress but dealing with difficult people and then testing spiritual gifts. These are all important things that we should all learn. And it's so clear. It's, it's a great book. I think it's going to be a great book to preach. Quite frankly, I've never preached through this book, and I hope to do that. And it's also a wonderful book for new believers to read because it has so many different topics that are short, succinct, direct to the point where we can actually learn things about um, what it's like to be a real, true Christian. And everyone can understand the message. It's just clear, simple, and plain. And here's some background that you probably should understand. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, it records a story of the founding church in Thessalonica. So the Acts of the Apostles ties back to the book of Acts, Thessalonica is the, the place where this book is written to. Thessalonians is the people that it's written to. But the, the city of Thessalonica, it was a seaport town in ancient Greece. And as such, it's an important cross roads of travel for east and west travel. And the port contained a superb harbor that attracted ships from every part of the Mediterranean Sea. And the famous Aegean Way, a superhighway system that connects Rome with Asia to the east, passed through this little place called Thessalonica. So it became a very strategic place, a strategic center for trade and commerce. And whatever happened there would soon spread everywhere. Perhaps a good modern equivalent would be... Um, maybe Los Angeles or Miami, and if we looked at it in an American sense, I'm not sure. But the population here consisted of four main people groups, the Greeks, the Romans, the Jews, and the Orientals. So it was a little bit of a metropolitan kind of place because people came from different places. It had mixed cultures and mixed people. And most of the people were actually idol-worshipping pagans. They weren't Christians. 
And so the Apostle Paul visited Thessalonica on a second missionary journey. And after preaching in the local synagogue for three Sabbaths, three different holy days, which might mean only 15 days, or it might mean somewhere of a longer period of time of preaching, um, if they weren't consecutive Sabbath days. I'm not sure, it doesn't tell us, but he was forced to leave town under pressure because the Jews got all stirred up at the, uh, the local level and, and, a, and a, you know, uh, I mean, it just caused all kinds of problems. So under pressure, um, Paul had to leave because it was just too much controversy. And Paul's brief ministry here resulted in a, just a small little congregation made up of mostly converted Greeks. People that wanted to follow Christ, Christ followers, but they were mostly Greek in origin, along with a few believing Jews and some leading women in the town. We'll get to all of that as this unfolds, but it was clearly predominantly a Gentile congregation, meaning non-Jewish. And in order to understand the letter, you need to know one important fact. Paul, the apostle, left Thessalonica before he really wanted to. He didn't complete all the preaching and ministry that he desired. And so he left prematurely. His premature leaving caused many of the younger believers to wonder about him, like, why are you just leaving? And his ministry was just kind of left up in the air. And some people were tempted to give up their faith under continuing pressure, especially pressure from people who were non-Christians. And then after leaving Thessalonica, the Apostle Paul went to Athens. And from Athens, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. Timothy was his understudy, a young pastor. He sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to see how the church was doing and, and then Paul went on to Corinth alone. He was traveling with Timothy, and so Timothy eventually reported back to Paul regarding this young church in Thessalonica. Evidently, he told Paul that the church was doing well, but was under immense and intense pressure to give in. Certain rumors against Paul were spread and circulated because he left town so suddenly and abruptly. There were also various moral and doctrinal problems in the church because they didn't have a moral foundation, a doctrinal foundation. And although though Paul wanted to return to Thessalonica, just circumstances were such that they prevented him from returning. So he wrote a letter of encouragement to this young church, hoping that the letter would suffice a personal visit or an in-person visit. And this letter we call First Thessalonians, the letter to the church at Thessalonica. To me, this letter reveals the heart of Paul, probably more than any other letter that he wrote in all of his letters. And if you want to know what the Apostle Paul believed, you can read Romans because it's a doctrinal masterpiece, as I've often called it, or at least that's what I call it. But if you want to know what he was like as a person, you can read this letter, 1 Thessalonians. The letter begins this way. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. How encouraging that must have been. These opening words must have been so encouraging to this young congregation made up entirely of new believers because none of them were believers prior to Paul's visit there, his ministry there. And everything that Paul writes is meant to lift their spirits. They were the church in God. They knew the Lord Jesus Christ. They experienced the grace and the peace of God. And Paul prayed for them 
He thanked God for them always. Consider the Christian graces that he mentions here. He says, the work that comes from faith, the labor that's occasioned by their love, the endurance that flowed from their hope. I mean, this trio of statements comprehends really the whole Christian life. The work that comes as a result of faith, the labor that's occasioned by their love, and the evidence that flowed from their hope, which begins in faith, continues in love, and culminates in the hope of eternal life. See, if First Thessalonians wondered how Paul felt about them, and if they were tempted to doubt the work of God in their midst, they only needed to read and then reread these opening verses. And that's why it's important for us as we study the Bible. It's like, haven't we been over this text before? You know, well, we read and we, we re, reread. <laughs> Say that four times fast. <laughs> you know, similar common verses to bolster our faith, to bolster where we stand in Christ, to, to cement it in our minds who God is and how he operates in our lives. See, God has power, is, is powerfully at work. And um, in just these brief couple weeks in Thessalonica, God was powerfully at work where a church was actually formed from scratch, where there was no believers in Christ. They didn't know Christ. They didn't know anything about Christ. And Paul established that church. And Paul makes this all abundantly clear that their growth and the favor that they found with God was established in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. With this as kind of a little bit of an introduction, the next few verses deal with the subject of their conversion. This is really important. See, step by step, the Apostle Paul recounts how these former pagans became fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. See, a lot of people attend church, but they're not devoted followers of Jesus Christ. There's a big difference between attending church and being a true believer and follower, a disciple, if you will. In one of his books, Lloyd Ogilvie pens this arresting um, sentence. He says, The great need today is for the conversion of religious people who, though they believe in God, are headed away from him and not towards him. And that's the way it is with a lot of people. They may know of God. You might have some form of mental ascent towards God. But, I mean, you're not really headed towards him in your lifestyle, in your deeds, in your words, in your actions. And then Lord Ogilvy goes on to say that authentic conversion always comes in response to God's call. See, God calls us first and always results in a radical reorientation of your whole life. See, if your whole life isn't, isn't reorganized and reorientated because of the gospel, you probably don't have God in the way that I'm speaking tonight. See, because if you truly are a believer and a follower of Christ, it changes your direction. It changes everything. And the change stands the test of time. It's not just, phew, I made it through tonight without doing those bad things I used to do. And then tomorrow I'll go back to them. No, the, the changes stand the test of time where you might not be perfect, but you're better than you used to be. I love um, one of my spiritual fathers, Pastor Beal. He said, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm sure a lot better than I used to be. And he says it's incremental change. We continue to make positive changes on an incremental basis. And we become more godly over time as we follow God. And a lot of people, they don't follow God closely enough to actually have the transformative nature of the gospel take root in their minds and in their hearts. And that's what happened to the Thessalonians. And as we review these verses... I challenge you to consider whether or not you've been truly converted to Jesus Christ. Because these verses clearly spell it out. And that brings us, you know, to this 
question that I asked earlier. How is a Christian defined? And how can you tell the difference between a Christian and a church member? Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. See, you can attend church your whole life. And you can grow up in church. But unless Christ grows up in you, that's all you are is a church member and not a Christian. So, like any good teacher, Paul starts at the very beginning here. And in verse in, in these two verses, Paul answers the question, what must happen first? He gives the two answers to that question. In order for a person to be converted, two things must happen first. Something from God's side, and then something from the human side. Those things have to happen. And God's side must always come first. So let's look at the divine side, God's side. He says, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Isn't that interesting? See, God selected. God chose you. This is the answer to the question, what must happen first? The answer is, God must choose you. In, the in theological terms, this is the doctrine of election which simply means that God chooses those who will be saved. And there's lots of controversy about this in different Christian religious circles and even other religious circles. But salvation begins with God's choice of us. Not with our choosing God, because if it was up to us to find God, we would never find him. Although we sometimes stumble at this truth and it's hard for us to grasp this truth, it should not bother us in the least. Some people make a huge difference in this. And it's not just this verse, but there's other verses that deal with election in the Bible. But it's sometimes made to appear that election is kind of this arbitrary choice of a celestial in choosing some and passing others. But that's not really what it means at all. That's not so. That some people just get passed by. See, the Bible teaches that election flows from the love of God. Election starts with God and it flows from the love of God. That's why Paul, the apostle, calls these new believers brothers loved by God. See, election is not a device for sending men to hell, but it's a device for rescuing people from hell. You know, and that's a whole different conversation because, you know, people say, well, why would a loving God send people to hell? God doesn't send anybody to hell. We make that choice. And I don't claim to understand all the mysteries of this doctrine. Let me just be clear. But it teaches me two things that are absolutely for sure. Salvation is a work of God, not of man. And the second point is, all believers can have eternal security in knowing about this. No wonder the 39 articles of the Church of England calls this doctrine full of sweet, pleasant, and unspeakable comfort. See, on the divine side... Conversion begins with the work of God in eternity, his divine choice to save men and women. And then there's the human side. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. See, a lot of people just say, well, the Bible's just words. The Bible's not just words. It's a book that has spiritual power. It's the only, I mean, if you go to the Library of Congress, you'd find out that there's Millions and millions and millions of published books. But there's only one book with power, and that's the Bible. But this book has power, power with the Holy Spirit, and it has deep conviction. You know, lest we become unbalanced, Paul immediately adds the human side to our conversion because there's the God side, the divine side, then the human side. God's election was made effective through the preaching of the gospel 
to the Thessalonians. The word was preached with power, the power of the Holy Spirit, producing deep conviction in the hearts of those who were the hearers of that word. When we say, oh, not with words only, he means that he didn't simply memorize some evangelistic presentation or rattle off some stale message or a message that he preached here, there, and everywhere. It was just some great oration of, of words. What he's really saying is it wasn't just by words alone that it was with the power of the Holy Spirit that these words were spoken that made a difference to the hearer of those words. And he didn't just rely on cleverness or some rhetoric to convince them. Have you ever, ever wondered why two people, and this is often very interesting to me, how two people can hear the same message and respond in opposite ways? Or afterwards, people will say, Pastor, why did you stare at me for a whole hour? You were speaking right to me. It's like, huh? What are you talking about? I mean, God speaks to you. Maybe he uses my voice, but I wasn't staring at you for an hour. I can assure you of that. <laughs> maybe the conviction of the Spirit was speaking to you, but or maybe these words just fit you. But, you know, it's the Spirit's power that transforms us and changes us. I might be the mouthpiece or the one that God uses to speak those words, but it's the power of his spirit that changes us, that's added to the words. You know, and it happens because one person hears the words while another person may have heard the message, or, or, or it's the Holy Spirit who takes human words and preaching and makes them just come alive in somebody's heart or in somebody's mind. And to me, this is a wonder and the glory and the divine serendipity of preaching. You know, it happens every single work. I mean, every single time, you know, I preach rather. You know, people will say, you know, that message, you must have, you must have been inside my brain or whatever, because it fit me. And, you know, it's like, okay. But, you know, I never know how people will respond to a message. I mean, I prepare them, I pray about how I preach, what I preach. But all I know is that I preach God's promises, that his word will never return void. See, preaching the word of God never returns void. Preaching the word of God always accomplishes the purpose that God had in mind from the beginning. But I never know in advance who my sermon will touch or who it won't touch. And that's why we ought to pray for the preaching of the word, because the preaching of the word, when it's combined with the Holy Spirit, is effective and powerful, and it never returns void. So we, we never understand what might be accomplished with the power of the Spirit. For without the power, even the best preaching is useless to change a human heart. It's the Spirit that changes the heart, not the preacher. You know, and some people, they get all connected to their preacher and listen to the preacher more than the words spoken, and that's kind of uh, not the way it should be. And um, it's kind of sad because nowadays, you know, we have kind of rock star preachers like, oh, did you hear the latest, greatest from this guy or this one? It's like, if you follow a person, <laughs> you're doing the wrong thing. But Paul now moves to the evidence of conversion because there's specific evidence about the conversion of a person. And in these verses, he answers the question, what should we, uh, what should we look for in a conversion? So there's three answers to that question, and they all, all revolve around how you respond to the Word of God. The first thing is this, we receive the word. And in verse 6, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, You know how we lived among, amongst you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. 
Notice that little phrase, in spite of severe suffering. See, the word literally means to be pressed to the limit. It has the idea of being under the thumb of another person, feeling the pressure of being pushed down and upon you. To welcome has the idea of opening your home, opening your heart to another person. In this particular case, that the Thessalonians were so glad to be saved that it couldn't be stopped, not even by persecution. They were under intense persecution for being Christ followers. But even in spite of that persecution, their faith couldn't be stopped. They were on fire for God. And we see this often on the mission field. I mean, you see it in places where the gospel and uh, faith in Christ isn't welcomed. Um, in China, in Russia, India, in Haiti. I mean, in these places where being a Christian, it really costs you something. You know, I mean, it's not so much in the American church, but I mean, literally there's martyrs in other parts of the world, even today. I mean, if you don't believe me, you know, go to Voice of the Martyrs. It's a, it's a group that uh, records martyrs of the faith. There's modern-day martyrs who die for their faith. That's how strong their faith is. They would rather die for Christ than denounce him. But here we tend, you know, in America, we just take our blessings for granted. You know, we think that it's all about us. Our church in America, North America, is so myopic. It's all about me. You know, for most people, the Holy Trinity is me, myself, and I. And um, not the Father, the Son, and the holy spirit as it should be but there's i mean when you think about this um these people they suffered greatly and they still wanted christ <laughs> see jesus never invites us to receive him on a trial basis you know i'm gonna try it i'll dip my foot in i'm not gonna jump in i'm not ready for that jesus never invites us on a trial basis you know, some of us try to do that. Well, I'll see if I like the flavor of this church or this um, walking with Christ business. You know, I'll just try it out. And if I don't like it, well, I can always do something else. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you know who Diedrich Bonhoeffer is. In the words of Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he says, When Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was against the Nazi re regime in World War II. He was a pastor. He was one of the few people that spoke against Hitler and what Hitler was doing to exterminate six million Jews. Ultimately, Diedrich Bonhoeffer gave his life because he was killed for what he believed. See, true conversion means that you continue to follow Christ even when the going gets rough. In America, when it gets a little uncomfortable, we back off and say, I didn't sign up for that. Are you, not, are you nuts? You know, we walk away, we run away. You know, we don't want problems. And, um, you know, I think uh, Bonhoeffer, before he died, said it well. God bids us to come to him and to die. So that's the first part, receiving the word. The second part is living the word. In verse 7 it says, And so you become a model to all believers in Macedonia and Arcadia. See, Thessalonica was the capital city of the providence of Macedonia. So anything that happened there would eventually spread across the entire region. Just as people talk about what happens in Hollywood or New York or Chicago or L.A., you know, they were talking about things that were happening in Thessalonica because Thessalonica was a happening place. The word model is the Greek word tupos, T-U-P-O-S, which literally for, refers to the impression left on a piece of metal when, pressed in, when it's pressed into clay. There's a, here's a great secret of evangelism. The best way to win others is by example of your own changed life. So you can preach to people all you want, but if your life is broken and busted and disgusted, 
People look at that and say, I don't want that. <coughs> I mean, the example of our own life is how we win other people. Remember what Jesus said to the man who wanted to accompany Jesus on his travels? In Mark 5, 19, Jesus said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. See, I mean, this guy wanted to accompany Jesus and be part of Jesus' uh, you know, 12. And Jesus said, you know, just go home to your own family. Tell your own family how much the Lord has done for you. I mean, if you can't tell somebody how much God has done in your life, you probably don't have much God in your life. We all know that a satisfied customer is always the best advertisement for any product. I was in marketing and, um, you know, um, a satisfied customer is always your best advertisement. I mean, that's why they have Google reviews and Yelp reviews and reviews on everything nowadays. You can go through, uh, look at almost any business and see, you know, are people generally happy about this place or not happy about this place? And most people, um, they vocally tell you <laughs> in the reviews what it's like. But the best place for you to make an impact for Christ is actually right where you are. You don't have to go overseas to be a missionary. You don't have to travel to some distant land to be a missionary. And um, you can start by living for Christ and showing others the difference that Christ makes in your life on a daily basis right where you are. You know, some people say, well, you know, when I get extra money or, you know, when I get older and, or, you know, at some point in time, you know, I'm going to go make a difference for Christ. I'm going to go to the jungles or, of some place or, you know, go to the other side of the world. If you're truly a Christian, you'll make a difference for Christ right where you are. And then the third thing is speaking the word. And it says this in our text, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Arcadia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I mean, um, you know, it's funny because even in this little church, um, you know, I go any place and people recognize me. I go to Myers, people recognize me. I go any gas station. I was at the gas station just today. And um, this guy says, you know, I just saw something online about you. You were on the cover of the Macomb Daily a few weeks ago, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, I thought you were that Santa guy. And, um, you know, but people connect you with things. I mean, you know, they know your deeds and they know if you're doing good. Um, we, we also went to um, the Warren City Council meeting last night. Sue and I did. And, um, you know, I told them about our Christmas party and, and what we were doing. But, you know, people know you by your deeds, what you're doing. And, um, you know, you don't need to say a lot about it, per se. You know, there's, there's a wonderful word picture in this verse. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. And, um, <clears throat> you know, just our little food ministry, you know, demonstrates love to this community week after week. Some people are just ornery and they don't appreciate what we do. But I mean, we pick up food seven days a week. And, you know, we have, you know, dozens of sources that give us food. You know, most people don't even realize, you know, um, all the food that we give out isn't free. I mean, we just wrote a check last week um, to Gleaners for $2,600. The people are like, no way. Everything you got's free. It's just free. No, it's not. And, um, you know, and it takes money to do what you do. But when you're on God's side, you're willing to do that because it makes a difference in people's lives. So the best place to make an impact for Christ is right where you are. If you can't make an impact right where you are, you know, don't think someday you have to uh, go out and, uh, and, uh, you know, do it someplace else. But when Paul says the message here in this text, it rang out. 
It's kind of interesting. The message rang out from you. He uses a term from the orchestra. It means like to strike a cymbal. You know, and as, <clears throat> as the Thessalonians shared Christ, their message actually reverberated throughout the entire region. See, there's people that don't come to our church, but they know about harvest time. It's funny because when somebody posts on one of the community sites, um, you know, that they need food or something, there's a little church that's called Harvest Something on Nine Mile. They give out the, some of the best food, and they have an abundance of food. People that don't even know who they are. And, I mean, you can look at the community sites, but when when... When you do something good, it reverberates. And, you know, lately, every time the people come for food, every time that I'm here, I, I, tell, I tell people, you know, we provide this natural food, but much more important than that, the best thing we got is spiritual. So I pray that the spirit of the living God would travel with this food you're taking home from God's house to their house that it would affect their hearts and their families and their households. Because it's not just the fact that we're passing out food. There's a spiritual component to it. And I pray that the Spirit of God would reverberate through the area, through South Warren and through this region. And just as, you know, what happens in other major cities eventually um, filters down to, you know, other states and other areas, you know, I mean, what happened in Thessalonica was soon talked about in other areas of the region. In the words of one commentator, he said, the, Thessalon the, Thess the Thessalonians, you know, sounded the, the revelry and the whole providence woke up. Wouldn't that be cool? Mm -hmm. If the words that were spoken through the church would wake up uh, the whole providence. But here then is evidence of conversion clearly exp explained. First you receive God's word gladly, then you live it on a daily basis, and as you live it, the message of the gospel reverberates in every direction, and those around you begin to sit up and take notice because of the reverberations of your life. Our passage contains one final truth that I want to get to tonight. It's in verses 9 and 10. And it answers that all-important question, how does all this happen? This is where the truth must become personal for you and me. If you would like to be converted, think about this. These two verses have been rightly called the three tenses of the Christian life. They describe the past, the present, and the future of those who have been converted. See, in the past it says, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols. See, they actually turned to God from their idols. And in the case of the Thessalonians, this was literally true. They had been idol worshippers before coming to Christ. And they turned from their idols to God. Suddenly their lives were dramatically and utterly transformed because they turned to Christ. And then you might say, well, how did it happen? They turned to God. This is what conversion means. This is what conversion is all about. The Bible sometimes uses that term that some people don't like, repentance, to describe this act or this process. But that's what they did. They turned. That's why I titled this message, Turn. But in the Old Testament, there, there's two Hebrew words for repentance. The first word is nakam, N-A-C-H-A-M. It means to turn around and to change your mind. When you see this word, repentance, in the Old Testament, it usually, it usually is translated as the word um, nakam. The, and then the second word is a sub of that word. And it's, that second word is used over 600 times in the Old Testament. And it's translated by such word as Turn, return, seek, or restore. And it's very important because you see it very often in phrases like, turn to the Lord with all your heart. See, you turn, you return, you seek, you restore. Now, when you come to the New Testament, there's a new word that you need to know. The Greek word 
metanoia. Um, meta means to change your mind, M-E-T-A. And repentance fundamentally seems to change your mind about something. It has to do with the way you think about something. You may have been thinking one way, but now because of the gospel and the Holy Spirit, your thinking's different and it's the opposite way. That's repentance, the changing of the mind. Let's suppose a man wanted to learn how to parachute. So he goes to a parachute school and they show him how to rig up his gear, how to pull the ripcord, how to land safely. Finally, the day comes when they take him up in an airplane, his big day. He's scared to death. But he's afraid to let anybody know that he's scared to death. And the moment comes when he has to jump. He goes to the door of the airplane. He looks down. Yikes. 25, 2600 feet to the ground. Yikes. His legs get weak. He's about to throw up. And somebody behind him is trying to push him out the door of the airplane. And at the last second he says, Nope. I'm not going to do it. They say, go ahead, you can do it. Go ahead, jump. He says, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to jump. And he doesn't jump. See, that man has repented. He's changed his mind in a decisive way, changed course. Even though he planned, he prepared, he was thinking about doing it. At the last moment, he repented. He didn't do it. And the story helps illustrate how repentance works. Repentance is a change in the way I think that leads to a change in the way I live. That's what true repentance is. A change in the way I think, which leads to a change in the way I live. When you really change your mind about something, it's going to change the way you think about it, the way you talk about it, the way you feel about it, and the way you act about it. I'm suggesting that true repentance is more than just a little game that you play in your own mind. Repentance is a decisive change in direction. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of thinking, which leads to a change of attitude, which leads to a change of feeling, which leads to a change of values, which leads to a change in the way I live my life. You know, to serve the living and true God, conversion fundamentally involves a change of gods. Where you once served sin and where you once served yourself, now you serve the living and true God. You don't just serve yourself. You don't just serve the sins that pop into your brain. Where you once bowed down to the idols, in your life? And you might say, I don't have any idols. Oh, yes, you do. Idols of pleasure. Idols of power. Idols of, I'm going to use these drugs or drink this stuff because I don't want to even be part of it. That might be your idol. Idols that I want to gain this material stuff because I want that more than anything else. Idols of, I want worldly approval. You know, I'm going to be the next president of the United States. That's not a bad thing. But, I mean, some people, they want power, and that's their idol. But instead of having your idols, now you bow to the, your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. The idols have less power, and you say, I want God more than anything else. Where you once served the dead gods of this world, now you serve the living God. You know, it's kind of interesting because in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says that we're living sacrifices. See, in the Old Testament, they had dead sacrifices. They took animals, they put them on the altar, they killed them. The blood was supposed to atone, but it didn't work. But that's the system that was set up in the Old Testament. See, now you are a living sacrifice. A sacrifice unto God where your life has changed, your life is transformed, your life is new. And it's made new by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
All those other idols that used to control you, porn and pleasure and power and stuff, mm -hmm. those don't matter because you bow your knee to Jesus Christ. Where you served, like I said, the dead gods of this world, now you serve a living God and you're a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You're not some dead animal on the altar. And once you followed falsehood, you now serve the one true God. This in many ways sums up the whole Christian life. We're here to serve God day by day. We're here to serve God moment by moment. Actually, we are God's servants. We're here to do His bidding. We're here to act on His behalf, always seeking God's best interests and hoping always to please our God. You know, as the song says, you got to serve somebody. And we all do. No one is truly a free moral agent. You might think so. You either serve yourself or you serve Almighty God. You can't do both. So what about the future? And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath, here is the future tense of the Christian life. We, in turn, we serve, we wait for the return of Christ. We wait for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This tells us that the second coming is not some esoteric doctrine that may or may never happen. It's an absolute doctrine that will happen, which we may believe or not believe, depending on our own preference. But this is the fundamental motivation for the entire Christian life, our future, our eternity. See, conversion begins when we turn to God. It's nothing more or less than an intentional turning of oneself to Almighty God. And because it's intentional, it's not happening by accident. It does not happen automatically. Nor can anyone else turn for you, you know. I'm riding on my grandma's coattails or my mama's coattails. I'm so sorry, your coattails aren't that long. Mama, grandma, or anybody else can't take you to heaven. You must decide for yourself to turn to God. No one else can make that decision for you. Your wife can't make that decision. Your husband can't make that decision. You have to make that decision. Conversion also means turning from your idols to living for the one and true living God. See, you can have your idols or you can have God, but you can't have both. To the Thessalonians, this was literally true since Greek religion was filled with idols of various kinds. All the heroic gods were supposed to dwell in Mount Olympus were nothing more than detestable idols. The religion built upon these idols was degrading, obscene, perverse. It generated fear and vengeance, immorality, demonism, and slavery. The idolatry was the foundation for government, religion, amusements, social clubs, and everyday labor. It permeated every aspect of society. For a Christian to reject all of that, and for a Christian to follow Jesus Christ meant rejecting the very foundation of society itself, much like we have to do today. It's so vile. Yet that is what Jesus calls men and women to do, and that is what the Thessalonians did. They rejected the world, and they followed Christ. It's important to remember just a couple more things. Just give me a few more minutes. It's important to remember that not all idols are made of wood or stone or metal. See, we think of idols as some, some object. We have our idols today, only they're more sophisticated. That's all. An idol is anything in the world which we look to as an ultimate source of value, something we want more than God. It could be a job, a house, a car, a title, a position, a possession, a drug, it could be alcohol. It could be that side chick or that side guy that you can't get out of your brain. You don't need that person. Anything you value more than God is an idol. 
Remember, the sin is not the wood, the sin is not the metal, and the sin is not the stone. Those things were and are morally neutral. Even the carvings and images themselves were not sinful. It was the meaning or the value that was attached to them that became sinful. In that sense, anything good can easily become an idol if we place it before our God. I just want to summarize all of this so we understand what I said and then what I didn't say. There's a few concise statements that are absolutely in this passage that I think I need to repeat. The first thing is, conversion is an act of God that begins in eternity with his choice of me. The choice, secondly, is made real in my life by the proclamation of the gospel, by the Spirit-empowered men and women who speak with full conviction. Thirdly, conversion ushers in a radically changed life which is built upon receiving, living, and speaking the Word of God. Those three are, are, are greatly important. We receive the Word of God, we live the Word of God, we speak the Word of God. And conversion thus means a revolutionary turning in my life from every idol and turning to the true and living God. And fifthly, conversion leads to a life of service to God as we patiently wait for Jesus to return. So, are you converted? It changes the direction of your life, and it stands the test of time. Either you're converted, or you're not converted. Either you've turned, or you've not turned. Unless you're converted, you will never go to heaven. It's that clear. So, can you be converted? The answer is simple. You must transfer your trust away from yourself and all those things that control you and place all your trust fully upon the Lord Jesus Christ. If anything controls you above Jesus Christ, you probably are not converted. You must turn from self-worship, good works, and every idol in your life and wholly depend upon Jesus Christ and Him alone as your Lord and Savior. The Christian life begins with conversion. Without conversion, there is no Christian life. And if you're not converted, you're not a Christian at all. One last story and I'm done. He was born in 1725. Long time ago. He was the son of an English sea captain. At age 11, he went to sea for the very first time. He was forced to join the Royal Navy. He tried to escape, but he was arrested in West Africa. He became the slave of a white slave trader's black wife. For two years, he lived in hunger and destitution. He eventually became a slave ship captain, taking black Africans to the Mediterranean and to the, from, to the Mediterranean and to the West Indies from there. In 1747, he boarded a ship for England. But a violent storm hit the North Atlantic and it hit his ship directly, which began to fill with water. The timbers of his ship broke away from the sides. An ordinary ship would have gone straight to the bottom immediately. But his ship was carrying local beeswax and wool, which were lighter than the water. In the midst of the struggle to save the ship, this young man said to himself, almost without thinking, if this will not do. The Lord have mercy on us. By his own words, it was his first desire for mercy that he had felt in many, many years. That was the turning point of his life. He left the slave trade and later entered the ministry in Olney, England. He became known as a great preacher who attracted enormous crowds. He wrote nearly 300 hymns most of which have long been forgotten. But some of his hymns are still sung today. Glorious things of thee are spoken. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds. But only one hymn, perhaps, is the most 
famous hymn of all that he wrote. And it's not only the most famous hymn that he wrote, it's one of the most famous hymns of all times. <clears throat> this famous hymn that he wrote is sung around the world by millions who sing it in dozens and dozens of different languages. That hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Before he died, this man, John Newton, prepared his own epitaph, which reads this way. John Newton, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. You see, that's what God can do. True conversion, that's what some of us need right now. You've heard my words, that's what some of us need today. See, I urge you to turn to God and turn from the idols that hold your heart, the idols that have your mind enslaved. If you have the slightest desire, turn. If you want to be converted, turn. If you want to seek a new life, turn. Have you ever been converted? If the answer is no, or if you're not sure, with all that is in me, I urge you, turn to Almighty God. Turn from your sin. Turn from your idols. Turn from your past. Turn from your self-worship. Turn from all that is evil. Turn to God and say, Lord Jesus, I transfer my trust to you as my Lord and Savior. I pray that you will do it even as you've heard these words. Let us pray. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you for this night, and I thank you for this word. I'm excited about this study in Thessalonians. I pray, Lord, that this message and the messages that are yet to come would have a great impact on those who are unlearned in Christian doctrine, unlearned in our Christian faith, that need a new foundation for a new year. Bless them with that, Lord. And I pray most of all, Lord, that people would turn as they heard these words and were convicted by the fact that we need to turn. We need repentance. It's primary. We need to confront our demons and we need to confront those idols that hold us in bondage. Bless us, Lord, and break those chains. But those chains will never be broken unless we turn to you. I pray, Lord, that by the hearing of these words from my mouth, that many would do just that. Turn. And it's in Jesus' name I say, Amen. Amen.